Hello, and thank you for stepping off the edge. I am your host, Jamie O, and I welcome you to episode 16 of the podcast, Swimming in Consciousness. It has been prepared for release over the course of February 2012. In this month's podcast, I have a delightful conversation with Neil Kramer to share with you. Neil is a great human being who seeks to empower people, and as you'll soon hear, speaks on many fascinating subjects. Reading from his neilkramer.com website bio, Neil is renowned for his unique blend of lucidity, empowerment, and authenticity. That bio seems quite prescient in suggesting that the themes explored include spiritual philosophy, transcending control systems, the inner work, nested realities, transformation, and conscious unfoldment, purifying the vessel, emotional centeredness, the root of mysticism, eschatology, paths to authenticity, encounters with paradox and phenomena, and secrets of inner alchemy. As you'll hear in the coming conversation, the episode title comes from a riff off a Terence McKenna quote that compares humans to fishes, only one of which is seemingly aware of the environment in which they exist. The interview is close to 75 minutes long, and there are two great writings I want to fit in at the end, so the comments at the outset are uber brief this week. Five short musical tracks are mixed into this episode, all but the first coming from the Creative Commons wonder site ccmixter.org. In order of occurrence, they are Infinite Consciousness by No Am that I found on archive.org, Spinning Between Earth and Moon by CC Mixter Rocco Vacco, Emerge Like a Star by B.O. Crew with vocals from CC Mixter user Snowflake, An Instrumental Track, Walking, Running, Flying by Tethia, and the slightly silly but consciously creative track Narrator by Mind That Map wraps up the episode. Up next, the Stepping Off the Edge interview I've enjoyed the most creating thus far with Neil Kramer. has made a lifelong independent study of philosophy, mysticism, shamanism, religious traditions, inner alchemy, occultism, and esoteric world history. He shares his path of transformation and empowerment in writings, interviews, and lectures, as well as giving one-on-one teachings and group workshops. He's a frequent guest on leading alternative radio and internet shows, and joins me today to step off the edge on many different wonderful topics. Neil, thanks for stepping off the edge. Well, good to talk to you, Jamie, and thanks for having me along. So I, one of the, the most recent things that I saw you had uh, contributed to in publishing form was the Sync book. And for people who haven't read it or heard of it, it's a 26-author compilation that explores and explains the study of synchromysticism, which it describes as the study of the phenomenon of synchronicity, when we notice the bleed through from one seemingly separate thing into another, or when we, for a brief moment, move beyond the mind's division of the world. When I read that, it brought to mind the study of astrology, and which sort of is a, a study that science generally refutes. But one of the past stepping off the edge guests, Barry Perlman, in discussing astrology, pegged it as a mystical craft at the center of which is a beautiful mystery, which nobody has yet been able to confidently say how it works, despite thousands of years of history of people getting similar results, sharing each other's experiences and research to build up a codified body of knowledge. Is that a similar description that you could apply to synchromysticism, or can you explain more of what it's about? Sure. Um, I would say synchromysticism, I mean, with the, with the sync book that Alan Green just edited and brought out, which is a nice and really nice piece of work, by the way. I've seen lots of books and stuff in recent times and anthologies and things that I've contributed to, and this one is, is a really nice one, really pioneering work, I would say. Um, There's 26 different contributors, as you mentioned, and I guess if you were to ask those people what is synchromysticism, you're most likely going to get 26 different variations of answer. Uh, My answer would be to say that it's really kind of like a sexy word that just means you're tracking coherence and meaning in the apparently random media plex and uh, the natural world and even just your regular daily life 
Um, but there is a an emphasis in many synchromistic studies on media, so music, art, video, television, movies, all the rest of it. Uh, those things um, contain, if you like, a fractal of your own life and of the universe's evolution. And with or without the director's and the filmmaker's knowledge, you can see these kind of really personal, fascinating motifs and archetypes that are like embedded within it. And it's, it's quite an interesting um, exercise, really, because one of the uh, criticisms that occasionally gets leveled at synchro mysticism is, well, if you go looking for meaning hard enough, you're going to find it in everything. And to some extent, that, of course, is true. Um, but it does follow that if you hold an idea in your mind and you spot it in, let's say, a movie, a science fiction or a fantasy or a drama or whatever, a cop show, it doesn't really matter, um, it kind of tunnels into that movie and then tunnels through lots of other related media as well. And so the art of it is is tracking that relationship and seeing what it tells you about the universe and about yourself. So it's like um, artistic sort of micro-macro um, landscape. And we all see it in different ways, The as I say, the contributors of the book. Um, and some people speak very philosophically about it. Some people speak uh, culturally about it. And some people speak in, you know, very plain street language about it. And that's the beauty of it, really, because you get the very sort of multi-dimensional picture. It's it's quite a new study, and so Hollywood's uh, greatly fascinating for me because I loathe Hollywood and most of the stuff it produces. So to see that in that environment, that even the synchromistic resonance works there, is very interesting. You don't have to particularly be into a particular genre or you know the studio system or whatever. You can see it everywhere. So yeah, it's it's really interesting. How does that connect or contrast to the idea of consciousness that the general scientific idea is that consciousness is just the reducible deterministic events of biochemistry? There's something about being a, a human that a heart beating, the brain uh, synapses firing, suddenly consciousness is there. But it sounds like there's more of a, an interconnection that you're describing with that idea behind synchromysticism. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just again, personally, I've always been highly suspicious of the idea that consciousness is just this kind of byproduct, this epiphenomenal blip that comes from having a brain. And I just never bought that, really. It just didn't feel right, even before I began any study or developed any sort of intellectual capacity whatsoever. I just That just didn't seem right. And from sort of high school onwards, whenever... Um, scientifically nuts and bolts focused people would speak in that way i listened to it and evaluated it and kept that as um some information to to consider but in my own contemplations and in my own felt experience it just hasn't proven to be the case at all that and consciousness is kind of more like an emanation that just goes through everything and my first observation about it personally was that rather than our brains producing it, uh, we actually kind of channel it or conduct it. So, like, you get a transceiver that transmits and receives. <clears throat> I think to consider the brain as a transceiver um, is probably um, not that surprising to some sort of pioneering physics and biology nowadays, but it, it was pretty um, paradigm-cracking only 10, 20 years ago, that would just be a, a bizarre thing to say. But I remember in email correspondence with um, Dennis McKenna a couple of years ago, he was like very much of the same thought. And he was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, everybody kind of knows that. But it's just the mainstream. It it really changes the game if you start to think that consciousness is this thing that flows through the universe, through matter, through um, the cosmos. And it's something that we hook into and um, psychedelics obviously being a McKenna is often something that comes up in, in his studies and conversations and so on and um, I think the approach of, of considering um, entheogens, psychedelics uh, tryptamines etc as a retuning device as like a machine for changing that dial 
has been quite interesting. And of course, lots of people have looked into that. But um, I think fundamentally, when you start to consider consciousness as uh, a system, as a river, as a flowing medium, um, a lot of things start to make a lot more sense. And all that kind of hokey spiritual talk about uh, consciousness creation creates uh, matter and you know we create the universe and stuff it becomes more practical and more credible that because what you're saying is well that this force exists and we can shape it and we can sculpt it and we um you know jack into it just like you tune your kind of uh, laptop into the internet you know you jump on the the web and suddenly you've got access to this stuff but what stuff you get access to this field of consciousness depends on you you as an operator your laptop the operating system on the laptop how much memory it's got the processor it's got you know so all those kind of metaphorical references are quite useful in considering how it works so if if you consider consciousness as this kind of galactic uh, multidimensional in uh, with just a vast array of knowledge and wisdom and experience within it what uh, changes everybody's experience of it is the sort of reality tunnel uh, that the operating system that you run in your mind and I think that's a lot of my work is really focused on um, examining what that is what is the operating system is it something that we came with is it something that naturally develops or is it ever manipulated is it modified can we change it can we rewire it you know how does that work so it's it's a very organic thing you know it's we talk about the internet and stuff but the principle of consciousness is very natural very organic it's it's like primal for me it's not something that is uh, in addition to uh, the universe or as to normal cause and effect life it's it's primary it's there right at the heart of it is, along with sort of those fundamental questions that you're leading towards of nature versus nurture and free will, as you were going through that description, I would wrote down a couple quotes uh, from Terence McKenna that I was listening to on the way home today. And one is you're describing the idea of consciousness as a flowing river. He was. I mean, I don't think you could discover consciousness if you didn't perturb it, because as Marshall McLuhan said, whoever discovered water. It certainly wasn't a fish. Well, we are fish swimming in consciousness, and yet we know it's there. Well, the reason we know it's there is because if you perturb it, then you see it. And you perturb it uh, by perturbing the engine which generates it, which is the mind-brain system resting behind your eyebrows. And that's that sort of interesting idea of the fact that you can influence your environment or draw in that energy and direct it uh, in the way that you want, in a similar fashion maybe to when you're standing in a fast-moving current, you're far better to try and wade over to the edge in the direction you want rather than trying to swim against the the current it just won't have nearly as much potential because mm. the, there's such an energetic challenge to overcome uh, how fast that water or consciousness energy might be moving the the ideas you were just touching on with reality tunnels uh, when I first had met you on part of KMO's tour on the transitional alchemy tour mm-hmm. you had connected that with the idea of creativity and the fact that you're actually tapping into something larger than ourselves. Can you maybe expand upon those two ideas, possibly from the perspective of someone who wants to increase the novelty of their ideas and how to improve those ideas being received in the wider world? Sure, yeah. Your reality tunnel, um, the the term reality tunnel was really coined by Timothy Leary, but it was probably more popularized by Robert Anton Wilson, who you know, found this term, which in, in regular philosophy is, is called representative realism. And it really states that you, you never truly have contact with reality itself. You have contact with a, a, a symbolic representation of it. And everybody's um, experience of that is very unique. So how you uh, interact with the world is shaped not just indirectly but very literally by what you believe and how you are brought up and your hopes and fears and dreams and desires and so on 
And those things don't don't just slightly, subtly alter it. They actually fundamentally manifest what your experience of reality is. So hence this very nice term, reality tunnel. You know, it gives the impression that you're moving almost in your own kind of world. You're tunneling through the universe in your own unique manner. Uh, my uh, conception of that is that if you don't take ownership of creating that tunnel, then the default reality tunnel is a consensus one, and you just gravitate into it. So people who do not consciously operate in the world, i.e., they just reflexively move around and do what they're told and vote Republican, vote Democrat, you know, go to the burger joint and dumb things that most people think is normal life. If you're not consciously creating your day and your minutes and your hours, then you gravitate into this mainstream kind of delusion, basically. And so if somebody, getting back to your question, was saying, well, what can I do to increase novelty and to have more synchronistic kind of magical element to my life the the answer is well the first thing you need to do is determine what reality tunnel you're moving in because if if you're not creating it then it isn't yours it's someone else's and as soon as you move out of the mainstream reality tunnel and you switch the television off and you stop looking to an outside authority to validate or instruct what you should be doing day by day immediately you face two interesting things. One is you have total free will, perhaps for the first time, uh, and you can determine exactly what you want to do. But kind of hot on the heels of that, most people don't really, hand on heart, want to be in that position. They prefer to be told what to do. And though um, some individuals might kind of like question or argue with that, they, they like to have multiple choice kind of lifestyle where you can say well you can do this this or this and those are your choices and you choose which one you want and that's still operating in the consensus reality tunnel it's, there's so many multiple choices though that it feels a lot like free will but it isn't and so breaking that tunnel brings the individual to uh, quite a crucial transformational stage in the normal awakening process of human beings which is you have to take ownership of your own destiny, really. You have to completely own what you're doing, everything that you do, everything that you feel, everything that you think. So with that freedom comes uh, a certain amount of responsibility and it requires a certain amount of integrity. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a, a critical step, is admitting to oneself, if that's the case, that you're not creating your own experience, you're kind of jacking into someone else's experience, you know, you're hot wiring someone else's experience. Um, and that narrative isn't being generated from your own sovereign being, from your own spirit, from your own mind, from your own individuality. So that has to stop straight away. So obviously the kind of people that I talk to, and I imagine the people you talk to just as much, um, that's a common theme is freedom. But it isn't just some kind of fanciful, uh, you know, bill of rights or, uh, you know, some legality of a piece of paper from the 17th century. It's actual sovereignty, sovereign spirit, where everybody is their own authority and everybody completely and totally decides who they are and what they're doing here. So it asks a very big question of oneself. You have to stand back and say, well, what am I doing? You know, what am I actually trying to achieve here? showing up on this planet what am i actually doing so talking of reality tunnels very quickly brings you to ask some very very big questions of yourself and a lot of people don't want to do that they're afraid of what that means they don't know how to navigate in that space so people like myself who have chosen to do that you know part of what i spend my time doing is describing what that means how it works why it's okay why it's a good thing and the sort of uh, sense and pleasure that it brings as opposed to the sort of misery and disempowerment that the, the mainstream reality tunnel of, you know, commerce and business and pharmaceuticals and all that nonsense, there's, there's no comparison. And as soon as you taste free will and the sort of spontaneous generation of your own reality from a place of pristine sovereignty, 
then you never look back, really. So I'm always trying to encourage people who have already taken the first step, because you can't really make anyone do that. But when people have, then they're, you know, they're on that path, they're on that resonance, and then you can speak to each other. So that's one of the things I spend some of my time doing. And I, I think you had an essay on your, your website published last year at some point called The Deep Joy of Denormalizing uh, mm. that talked a lot about that fact. And one of the quotes I wrote down here was that it's absurd for any sentient being to believe that they can be informed, educated, or entertained by the screens and pages of the construct. Is there anything of value there? Crumbs will fall from the table occasionally, but they're eclipsed by the constant torrent of normality that pours into the third eye. So it's trying to walk that line of, you know, science and general perception and Western culture and everything says we're just living in this third dimensional reality. What is that consensus reality tunnel physically? Or I think where you're going with this is sort of the idea that we need to escape it and be directing it ourselves. But why do we need to escape from it? Well, a long time ago, I think we could say that... um, there was a platform, a kind of symbolic platform set up, which uh, the Hindus called Maya, which is a, a representation of ultimate reality based in, in physical form. And this world of forms is uh, very fascinating, of course. We all show up in it and we look around and there are trees and rocks and cars and streets and people and refrigerators and all kinds, all manner of different things. And I think a lot of people come to the point where they realize that that's that's real you know that stuff is there um it's not um ethereal because we, we bump into it every day only only last week i burnt my arm on the stove for example and it, it felt very real then let me tell you and um it's something that affects us it's something that we interact with and it's it's kind of a what you might say is a particular vibration of energy a particular density of energy and what I'm saying is that, yeah, that's, that's legitimate, that's part of life. You know, it's not to come here and ignore that. So the escapist attitude is one that I don't really condone. So I, I would just steer people away from that language because unless you engage with life, no prospect of really ascending or transcending or developing yourself, you know, you might as well just go and sit in a cave or get a little shack in the woods and just, you know disappear on your own which which is fine if someone wants to do that good luck to you but that's that's not what it's about it's it's meant to be engaged with what i'm saying is that that's one aspect of reality that's one very thin aspect of reality and this what was a a kind of organic emanation as a teaching mechanism maya to say hey guys look at form and see where that leads you and we have all this Uh, religious and mystical and philosophical scientific knowledge to show us what form teaches us about the universe and what's behind form, what generates form, where does it come from. Um, That was organic, shall we say. And what happened uh, some time ago, several millennia ago in my view, uh, was that that was kind of uh, seized upon by uh, a thought, well, we can prolong an ignorant state of being, which makes people, from a practical point of view, easy to govern, and from a more esoteric point of view, um, uses consciousness as a fuel source. We can achieve that by keeping everyone ignorant. And so what is put forth as reality is such a paltry, pathetic sliver of existence that it's kind of just a disgrace, really, that people accept that as the whole thing, as the whole of reality. Uh, It's not. It's a very, very small part of it. And what I'm saying is that what people are looking out at every day when they walk outside the front door is legitimate, but it's only like 0.0001% of what's actually going on. And so it's not to be escaped from, it's to be expanded upon. It's, it's a legitimate part of the universe, but it's a very small part of it. So to engage with the wider uh, phenomenal uh, universe is part of ascending through that Maya and understanding that it's a gross level of matter. Only like a rock is a gross form and like a Mozart uh, symphony or whatever 
is a more refined form. It doesn't mean one's better than the other necessarily. Um, it's just different. It's like a tree is different than a cactus, right? So like a 100-foot pine tree isn't better than a little tiny button cactus in the, the deserts of Arizona. It's different. And so forms refine as they go through this uh, system and they move through this organic process of ascendance, which is one of knowledge and of wisdom and of growth and of being and of purification. And it's a, from what I can see from my studies, but more importantly from my experiences, it's a totally natural thing to ascend. And what's happened on Earth is that that ascension process has been stalled, has been um, delayed, and it's become very static. And people just kind of show up and the game is, well, go to Earth, uh, get some nice things and try and enjoy yourself. And that's what most people's life consists of. And, you know, a lot of Americans and, and Britons and Europeans really what normal people want is a nice car and a nice house and that's that'll do them and i'm saying well that that's okay but that is really is eclipsed by the sort of majesty of what's possible here but before people can sniff that they need to you know take a long hard look at the way they live in their lives and what they're doing and that's that's something that has to come from the individual like i say they have somebody has to take that step look around and say this is shit, basically, and this, it's got, we've got to be able to do things a different way. Um, but rather than just fiddling about with the pieces on the chessboard to put a better configuration of attack or defense or stasis or whatever, I say, no, forget the chessboard altogether, forget the whole thing. Whatever configuration you choose, however clever you are and however many times you move ahead to... Um, you know, preempt your opponent's moves or whatever, you can't win because the game is kind of rigged, really. So it doesn't matter how much money you get and how healthy you are. Ultimately, it's um, a disenfranchisement from real life, the consensus reality tunnel. It's not normal. And so um, there is a conspiratorial element to that, but that's a very thin one. It's a very kind of freshman thing to do that. Conspiracy is like year one and you know, year two is a lot better and you leave that behind. Then there's year three, year five, year seven, year 20. And that, that just gets left behind. But there does, there does uh, come a point where the individual has to admit to themselves that they're not happy with what's going on. And more importantly, that they've been living inauthentically to themselves. And I think that's a big ask for anybody. And we all feel that. And we all kind of shrug sometimes and say, well, you know, what else are we going to do? You know, I'm doing the best I can. But that inauthenticity is a test, you know, even though the system's gone a bit strange, it's still a test. And ultimately, from a very high level, even though the game's been hijacked a little bit, um, it actually accelerates growth. You know, it really brings us to a point of optimal ascendance to stand back and say, well, maybe watching Newt Gingrich and Mitt Romney argue um, on the television isn't actually necessary anymore. Maybe I don't need to worry about that anymore. I can actually switch that off and concentrate on what is authentic because that certainly isn't. And I think, again, hand on heart, sat on the electric chair of truth, as I like to call it, where a wrong answer gives you a massive shock. Um, if, if you seat someone on that electric chair and ask them, are these authentic people? The answer, of course, is no, they're not. And so the next question is, well, what do I do? And you start with your own consciousness, your own experience of consciousness, and you start with your own family and your own community and your own environment and your own way of life. And knowing you a little bit, Jamie, I know that's something that you know all about. That's where it starts. And it starts, you know, in your own heart, basically. It sounds a bit corny, that, but it's true. And so there has to be an admission of um, refusing to live in authentically anymore. And as soon as you do that, the universe, I like to say, can see you at that point and it can detect you amid the sort of chaos of what's going on here. And it's very supportive of that process. And it involves risk as well, which is something that you're not allowed to do in the West. You're not allowed to take risks with life. You can take risks with 
money and you can take risks with relationships and so on, but you're not really allowed to take a risk with your whole worldview. And ascendance requires that as a basic requirement. It's there. You, you, need, you need that to get in. The universe loves risk because when risk is taken from a point of integrity and sovereignty, i.e. you're doing it for something um, good, shall we say, to cut a long story short, then it rewards that by throwing synchronicity, synchronous uh, events like growth, special relationships, special opportunities, support, encouragement, lucky breaks, whatever you want to call it, those things start to happen. Um, and that's the kind of momentum of the universe. Once ascendance to occur, it's waiting for it to occur in the individual. So it's a big topic to explore, but that whole thing of the the construct, as you're know, going back to what you said a, a little while ago, um, you know, it's a distortion. I have a, a book coming out in the spring, and you know, it's a distortion of reality. And um, people have got so. Um, enamored and so accustomed to that distortion that they've confused it with the actual real thing and it's been that way for a long long time not just a few hundred years but a few thousand years and um, again this is just a cycle actually it's not like um, a, a bad story it's a natural cycle and um, during the kind of shadow of this cycle you realize that a lot of the nastiest worst things that we see in the world um, are actually our fault to some extent. They're like projections of our own disavowal, our own disownments. So it gives you an opportunity to actually right, sit down, stop pissing about with the things that you thought were important, put them away because they're not, and actually focus on what really matters, which is your own integrity and consciousness and growth and compassion and love and um, creativity all those things, all those things that are not allowed in the mainstream construct, not really, they're not really allowed. You have to just have kind of fragile, feeble simulations of it, you know, vicariously through the television, through crap jobs and all the rest of it. Those things we can all do. It doesn't matter who it is. If you get somebody in a pure state of mind, in a true state of mind, Everybody wants to do that. They want to be happy. They want to be compassionate. They want to grow. They want to share. They want to make music, etc. And it's not a hippie thing at all. It's totally, totally a normal human projection of energy. And some people do it technically. Some people do it in a literary way. Some people do it artistically. You can do it with food. You can do it with farming. You can do it with textiles, whatever. Everybody has their own uh, resonance with that. Um, and people... I just come into a point now, I think, where a lot of that distortion is becoming very self-evident and people are thinking, this has got to change. You know, I, I don't think I can drag myself out to the, the ballot box and put a tick against any candidate anywhere in any party, in any country anymore, because it's, it's total nonsense. And, you know, even old timers uh, like my parents, for example, who are now starting to stand back, and I don't talk an awful lot about any of this stuff with them. Um, you know, they come to their own conclusions. And, you know, my father said recently, he says, I just kind of don't believe in it anymore. It's just nonsense, isn't it? Maybe it always has been. And that's a really, really tricky thing to say if you're, like, 65, you know? It's like it means that you've, you've had the kind of wool pulled over your eyes for a long time, and that takes guts to say... Well, maybe I have, but it's never too late to do something about that.
it means that you've, you've had the kind of wool pulled over your eyes for a long time and that takes guts to say, well, maybe I have, but it's never too late to do something about that. Yeah, there, there's the idea I've heard you describe it elsewhere as there's a, an innate impulse about why the place, as in the world, doesn't run so well. And <laughs> I, I think for myself, starting this podcast was one way to just sort of try and work through the things that I'm seeing, which are fantastic in yeah. isolated parts of the world and, and have conversations with those people to try and uh, raise the awareness of these great things that are happening. Because there's there's such a... Um, a push, at least from the the mainstream media, if you will, uh, in regards to all these negative things that are happening, and they try and give the impression that that's the standard, that's the way things are. Yeah. If I look at it from a percentage point of view, the amount of people who I interact with on a daily basis that are either neutral or positive in my life is far outweighs the negative. But it's they have this idea of they've now sort of caught on to the idea of collapse. Uh, as a narrative to try and say, oh, you know, we're going to have all these problems and, and that sort of stuff to drum up interest to keep you in that negative spin cycle of energy that uh, sort of keeps rolling around. Yeah, and that's a key point. I mean, I wrote an essay like five years ago or something, I can't remember, which was saying if you take the headlines from CNN and BBC and ABC and Sky News or whatever the, the stations are where you live in the world, if you, if you sit them next to each other and look at how the headlines are worded and the newspapers or the websites, they're overwhelmingly negative, overwhelmingly negative. And that is something that does not represent real life at all. Uh, as, you, as you say, in fact, when I step outside of my front door, like I did today, go into the town near me and, you know, go to the grocery store, speak to some people, have a cup of coffee, walk around, look at the sky, look at the street, whatever, just do regular things that everyone does. It's not a negative experience. And as you, again, as you rightly say, most of the people I communicate with, I like the way you put it, are either neutral or positive. There's very few negative people around. And that isn't represented on the screen that is not represented on the mainstream screens of television and internet. It's not there. So if your only source of information is the mainstream screens, then you get in a distorted, a hugely skewed view of what is actually occurring in the world because what's occurring is always growth and is always evolution. But that isn't good for business, so that gets just resigned to the sort of back pages of some liberal left-wing newspaper maybe if you're lucky but even then it's it's pretty uh puny compared to the you know the real brilliant stuff that is occurring all over the place so like you um i decided a while ago to you know make it my personal business to engage with the good stuff and to expand upon it to encourage it to understand its relationship to the mainstream and so on and, of course, that means that you're going to um, increase the averages of the positive, empowered people that you deal with on a week-to-week -week basis. But even having said that, just the regular people, like, you know, I was in, like, a, a carpet shop or something the other day, and, you know, just good people, just good people uh, with big hearts wanting to do something real, fed up with what's going on around them, not sure what to do, um, but... I can just tell that the resonance is, is true, you know, the people of integrity or just, you know, buying a coffee or, you know, I had to, a tree fell on the car the other day, so uh, wilderness living has its uh, challenges and I had to go to the body shop to get the car repaired and just just great people, which is surprising in, in a, an auto repair shop, but really great people. And I just I just kind of just think, you know, when you resonate on that frequency, you attract that and they attract you and you move in a space that you start to realize you, you're starting to sculpt that uh, trajectory, you're starting to sculpt that potentiality. Whereas if you're negative, then you draw negativity to you. Um, and I just think that that process is becoming very obvious to even the plainest consciousness now that there's something to that it's not just random it's not coincidence it's not just 
um, you know, the old positive thinking that sports people would uh, harp on about in the 80s and 90s is something a little bit more magical and fundamental than that. And that process is key here because um, for the mainstream, it's very worrying to see people doing this because they begin to uh, lose respect for authority, uh, the old authority figures, the old hierarchy. When you realize that there's only you and there's only the divine, if we can put it that way, and that's it, and you're an aspect of the divine, you don't really answer to anyone except yourself and you don't really have to do anything except what you choose to do and you don't really even fundamentally have any responsibilities except the things you choose to do and that empowers the individual the real sovereign human being and it disempowers the system that tries to um, diminish humans because I am a champion of humankind although it's very easy to dismiss humans for all the bizarre stupid shit that they get up to um, when you realize that that is kind of like has been a trick has been a sleight of hand then things start to change and you realize that there is something fundamentally um, good and transcendent and um, enriching in a lot of people now it's it's not just like some of the conspiracy people say that when when the um, the wool is pulled from people's eyes, they suddenly all spring up and we all join hands and dance about and live in paradise. You know, there's a lot of very, very stupid people in the world. There's a lot of very dumb people in the world who have completely detached themselves from their own intellect and their own creativity and their own compassion. And the statistics for mental health in America are just frightening when you look at them and what's happened over the last 20 years since the 80s. Uh, it's like one in six people kind of meets the criteria for uh, this sort of American mm. Association for Mental Health for what is mentally ill, you know. So that's like an extraordinary number of people. Um, and I, I saw another statistic recently, uh, somebody said it on the radio actually, that um, America used something like two-thirds of the world's antidepressant pharmaceuticals uh, and that's just 5% population. So that's incredible disproportionate um, correlation there. It's very odd indeed. Very. And it's it just shows that it doesn't work. It's not about capitalism or socialism. It's nothing, nothing to do with politics. It's about the way people live their lives. And that is changing. And that is um, unstoppable, basically. So I'm extremely optimistic about that. But it's a bit odd because neither ourselves nor our fathers nor our grandfathers or anything like that, nobody's seen what the alternative looks like for a long, long, long time. And we're led to believe that, well, you either have order with the White House and 10 Downing Street or you have Mad Max chaos where people are firing, you know, explosive arrows through each other's heads. And that, that's, that's the narrative um, that is set forth as a as a as a the only possible outcomes, and it's just not like that at all. It's just not like that. Humans have lived for tens of thousands of years. If you look at particularly the alternative historical timelines, in total peace and harmony, and the warring aspect of humanity, I would say is not natural. It's a fabrication. Most people I have ever met in my life, and have met a lot of people, do not have those impulses they don't want that it's it's a tiny tiny number of people who who want to live in that manner and so you know you have to you have to take a long look at who is it who's telling you that we have to go on the offense to defend ourselves you know it's it's simply not true and and the idea maybe of what reality tunnel that those people who are uh, putting those narratives forward are interested in projecting and yeah. I think I've sort of he heard the idea that uh, politicians should wear the uh, symbols on their clothing of the companies who are financing them. <laughs> um, I like that. And what sort of impact that might have. Yeah, I, th I, th I think fundamentally, um, I mean, it's fascinating living in America now. There is a myth of American innocence that the Americans are the good guys, the ones with the white T-shirts doing everything cool and 
it was a republic set up to get away from the corruption and misery of of European overlords and stuff. It's it's a total a total fantasy, a complete fantasy that. And I think that to some extent everybody's kind of in the same boat. You know, we're all Europeans, we're all Americans, we're all Christian, we're all Muslim. Earthlings. You know, somebody sent me an invoice the other day for something, um, and it had my, my details on it, and it just said, Neil Kramer, uh, Planet Earth, Milky Way, the universe. And I just kind of <laughs> laughed, and I realized that they just put it in because they didn't have the right address or something. But I just thought, you know, it's funny that, because fundamentally that is the situation that we're in. And those um, those conflicts and those prejudices, if you actually... Um, scrape a little tiny bit with your thumbnail beneath the surface. They just vanish. They just disappear, completely disappear. And nobody really gives a, a rat's ass about skin colour or ethnicity or religion or whatever. You know, do whatever you want to do, but fundamentally people just want to grow and they want to create and they want to um, have pleasure and have knowledge and they want to ascend and they want to, in my view, go home You know, to the place where we come from. And I think that is that is not an acceptable conversation to have in the mainstream. You, you're not meant to talk about that. And if, if you do insist on it, then you must do it in one of the Abrahamic religions or, or not at all. And I think, again, that's changing. You know, people are starting to ask very straightforward, common sense, plain speaking, metaphysical questions about who are we, what are we doing, uh, what does this all mean? And I think that tide of um uh, inquiry is growing and it's you know it's a very very positive thing to see yeah it's really the the idea of philosophy and just asking some of those critical questions of what does it mean to exist and yeah. uh, have your place in the world that you know we we might hearken in textbooks back to socrates and plato and such but there's really been that gap where the scientific method and science has come up and said, "No, we we have all the answers. We we can create the things you need, and it'll it'll be material in this world, and that'll get you what you want." And we've now started to realize, hopefully, there's a, a tipping point maybe coming where more people are recognizing, "No, we actually need more than just the the physical we, world." We do, yeah, because you you need uh, felt experience of your own uh, growth and your own life. And if you think about, you know, the the predominance of science uh, at the moment, it's very funny, really. Um, you know, what what the scientists do? They essentially they measure things, don't they? That's what they do. They measure various things in the universe and try to describe how they fit together and what they do. And there's a place for that, but to have that as the sole arbiter of truth and of reality is so preposterous that it's just funny to me. And I think, again, you, you see the extraordinary arrogance of a few scientists, because I know some amazing ones as well, who are brilliant, brilliant people. Uh, that, again, is a, is a falsehood. You know, they have been put into that position uh, synthetically, artificially, uh, because it's, it's stupid. And then you get this swing back to religion and then back to science and then back to whatever... It's like it's, we need all those things. You know, we need some sort of spiritual uh, framework. We need teachers who can talk to us about spiritual matters. We need science. We need mysticism. You know, pioneers will go out there and make wild speculations, some of which are nonsense and some of which are fantastic, amazing, revelatory knowledge. And you need all those skills, you need all the engineers, you need the musicians, you need the painters, you need the mums, you need everything. You need all that stuff. And humans are uniquely sort of uh, born with all those amazing skill sets, and they're all, they're all relevant. And I think that in my uh, studies, and again I talk about this uh, in, in new writings in the book, but you know we're all philosophers, we all have that philosophical impulse, everybody does. And some people are a bit embarrassed to go into it because maybe they feel they don't have the vocabulary or they don't have any um, qualification. But that's just nonsense. You know, that's bollocks. Nobody needs to worry about any of that anymore. Everybody is a philosopher because philosophy just means that you love wisdom. That's what it's from. Uh, you know, that's the, the root of the word, the etymology. It just means a love of wisdom. And everybody knows that with a kind of... Uh, 
few pocketfuls of wisdom, you can go a long way and it makes life a lot better, a lot smoother, a lot more fulfilling. So everybody loves wisdom, really. Um, it, it enables you to engage with life in a much more gratifying way. So in that sense, therefore, everybody is philosophical. And I think we have to disengage from the idea that it's just guys with uh, degrees and professorships or whatever who are um, capable of making any sort of credible statements about that. In my view, it's not at all, the, by, by far and away, the most um, stunning pieces of uh, information and knowledge and wisdom that I've ever come across um, are not from academic people. And I meet a fair number of those in my travels. Uh, but th it's rarely from them. You know, you're getting accounts of things, you're getting classical narratives, you're getting uh, sound bites or whatever. But actual felt experience is not hugely encouraged in academia. Um, so for me to see somebody uh, who's actually gone through it and lived it and, you know, sweat it and bled it, it infuses their wisdom and their information with something you know really resonant really vibrant really pure and it just it just supersedes everything else so you know that information that's full of uh that the books are full of you know particularly in the last 200 years a lot of it's like it's very nice it's a, it's a good framework it, it's it's useful to have those models um particularly in european philosophy but without applying it to your actual daily life to what you're doing on you know a monday afternoon what you're doing on wednesday morning if that isn't directly applicable it's it's a waste of time you know it has to be infused with life you know so that hence we come to the, the term gnosis which is far more interesting than just information just knowledge you know gnosis is where you're actually living that wisdom into your life and that, that again ties back to that idea of the reality tunnels. And if you're just following along what the textbook says versus learning it and feeling it for yourself, it's not the, uh, you're not living on that same scale and sort of driving your own reality tunnel or where it really gets into from an individual and societal level. I think it was a past episode of the serum, grasp the nettle, you use the hermetic statement as above, so below. To, to sort of encapsulate that notion that there's an inseparability of imagination and reality and your beliefs and being and everything, it's all interconnected, but you have to be the one that really drives where that goes and what form that takes on. And you could look at, you know, the, as you described, the, the negative people in the world, that's really just an opportunity to look at what the characteristics that you see negative in them are perhaps reflections of your own characteristics and how can you learn from that interaction to make yourself a better person and build your reality tunnel in a more positive direction. Yeah, absolutely. It, it becomes pretty difficult to ignore your own growth when you're looking at um, the negative, concrete demons of the world. I think, again, it's becoming slightly more perceptible to some and hugely more perceptible to others that that stuff is a projection of us not only collectively, but personally, individually as well. So you can't really get away with anything. You can't just think, well, that's a bit difficult. I'll just put that to one side and maybe no one will give a shit and it doesn't really matter. You, you can't do that. You know, that's why we're kind of in the mess we're in because a lot of people have been doing that for a long time. So a, a very literal level, once again, if you make the effort to go in and look at some of your bad wiring that you, you've been living with and to go to some emotional uh, hurt points and to go to some prejudices and to go to some aggression inside you, if you make the effort and have the guts to go and face that, um, a transformation takes place in that suddenly a lot of the obstacles that have prevented you apparently from going forward and from becoming truer in your own actions and uh, your own thoughts, they they dissolve. And so you think, well, hang on a second. Is it, is it all me? Is it all what's inside me that affects what's outside? And the answer is yes, it is. And that um, hermetic idiom that you quote, as above, so below, the other very often um, ignored part of that same statement is as within, so without. And that 
shows us that this microcosm, macrocosm um, philosophy is, is very old. You know, it predates the Egyptians, the Sumerians. You know, it goes back before we can even figure out who was thinking about it. And the hermetic philosophers and sages and thinkers and Gnostics and everyone else have come back to this and said, you know, it isn't symbolic. It isn't just archetypal. It isn't just some sort of metaphorical, psychological aberration. It really is. We generate this whole thing. You know, we generate it because we're sculpting it. The energy's there, and it'll be there without us. Consciousness is there, and it's there without us. But when we show up, we become a participant in that. And a very powerful consciousness could change a whole community, just one individual. But a group of powerful, conscious individuals can change like everything. So it is about a critical mass, and it is about people who found themselves endowed with that power of clarity and of will and of intelligence and of uh, creativity to actually do something about it, to use it and not fritter it away, to actually um, engage with it and to share it and to realize that, you know, we have those things for a reason. We have that articulation and that understanding for a reason and it's not just an accident, and it's not just some little weird thing that shows up on the radar. It's, it's there for a very distinct purpose. And um, that's really a question of confidence, because once more, uh, the Consensus Reality Tunnel says, well, if you're going to do something about that, you need to go to university, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to work in this particular niche, and you need to express it in this particular way. That, that just has to be done away with. If it's beneficial to go and study in an academic sense, then great, do it. You know, there's some good things to be gathered by some people in some situations. But you kind of don't need anything, particularly with the Internet now, um, with some discipline and some discernment and some focus. You know, there's never been more information available. There's never been so much text available. You know, um, Plotinus, the... Uh, Greek philosopher from the sort of third century, you know, one of my sort of heroes, really. He had to travel, you know, a long, long way to go at the age of uh, 27 to to go to the Library of Alexandria and, you know, study there and then go to uh, Persia and study there. And, you know, these, these, like, now we can fly around and get there the next day. But in those days, some of the journeys, particularly to the Arab lands, were treacherous, you know, really difficult, long, you know, life-challenging journeys. And There's that, no guarantee you were coming back. Yeah, yeah. There, wasn't, there, wasn't any, there wasn't any guarantee at all. In fact, um, Plotinus went with an army, um, and he thought, oh, well, that'll be interesting because we'll get to Persia, you know, and then I'll be there so I can study. But the army that he went with uh, got slaughtered, and he, was, he just found himself, like, you know, in this place on his own, really, and he had a hell of a time getting back. But that information now, you could download everything that he looked at, like in half an hour on the internet in PDF files, you know. It's unbelievable. So the, it's there. The information is there. What you have to build is, as I say, is your discipline and your discernment and put the attention into it and put the focus into it. And that is a challenge for a lot of people, particularly a lot of younger people today who have been brought up on this diet of facebook and twitter and youtube where you know the, the fragmentation of your focus is inevitable and that you get these little tiny chunks of stuff and people just fly around from one image to the next from one clip to the next and you know the libraries are going out of business you know not necessarily because there's no money for it it's because nobody can be bothered reading anymore you know to sit with a book and actually read it from cover to cover over a few days or a couple of weeks or whatever. Not many people are doing that anymore because it's too hard work. It's too much like hard work. So sometimes there's a space for that. You know, I did like a six hour, six and a half hour plane journey the other day. And I was glad that on my little smartphone, I had a load of MP3 lectures and podcasts and whatnot to listen to. That's brilliant. You know, really, really nice. Yep. But it's a good exercise to read because it teaches you how to focus. It teaches you how to keep your attention on one thing for a, a certain amount of time. And um, not everyone's doing that anymore. So, you know, <laughs> it's quite interesting, really. But 
you know, those, those media uh, places, again, they have uh, value, but you have to control what that value is. So if somebody's saying, oh, it's all about YouTube now, nobody reads anymore, well, that might be true for somebody, but it isn't, it isn't for me. So you decide what that is for yourself, and you decide what you're going to do to um, control your own attention span and what, what are you going to put your attention into, because really, that's all you've got. The only thing that we have is our focus and the most kind of um, amazing thing you can do is to give that focus to like another person, for example. So if you're spending your time with a particular person, you can't do a more fundamentally amazing thing than to say, well, this is all I've got and I'm, I'm sharing it with you. And then in terms of knowledge, to put your attention into a particular subject and say, well, this is all I've got is my consciousness and my focus. Everything else is temporary, but this is it. This is what I've got, and I'm going to put it into this subject. So you can either study something of meaning, something exciting, something deep and re reinvigorating, or you can watch, you know, absolute tripe on television, which, like everyone else now and again, you know, I fall foul of that as well. But every time I do it's always more comically pathetic than last time and it lessens the likelihood of me ever doing it again. I was in a hotel recently because it was an ice storm here, as I mentioned previously, and uh, kind of needed to do some stuff. So there was no power here for a week, nothing, not even any running water. So went to a hotel, you know, kind of got clean and tidy, got on the internet, did some work stuff and uh, watched some television and, oh, my God, oh, my God, American television, I mean, there's some interesting things on there, but the most stunningly bizarre thing is that you cannot go, like, I think about six minutes without the program switching to something else, either trailers or commercials or something. You, you do not get any slice of television on any subject, any subject, for more than about six minutes, and that is intolerable for me so I had to switch it off inspiration ignites an invisible channel that opens between the shade and the soul fingers become mere extensions hands only servants to a vast silent source unseen yet I let go I lose any separate identity from this infinite fountain the pours a river of heaven through me we merged like a stone whose golden cups paint the universe. Her creation absolves time. look at TV now that it, it it's more of a commentary on society at that time to drop into those channels and sort of uh, surf along them and and see what those mainstream narratives are but uh, I agree that you can't stay there for too long unless it starts to sort of drag you down going back to a couple things that you touched on in that that last uh, segment which was fantastic if people are interested in reading more uh, one of the essays on your website that I was hoping to touch on but I think we're going to be a little bit short on time here. The essay from Neil's website was So What? And it, it had a really good set of filters. I think there were five of them that you can use to evaluate information that you're receiving from different media sources and use that as a way to understand if you're going to go and watch TV, what are you getting from it? Who's the one giving you the information? What is their sort of driving purpose? Again, back to that reality tunnel. And there's another one, Path of One, that I didn't write down as much of, but I think ties into well with what you were talking about in that idea of self-study. Yeah, 
Good. Well, I think there is a, there is a lot of stuff in there, and a lot of it, as frequently happens, a lot of the things that uh, I speak about, most of it is kind of old wisdom from like way back. Um, what's new is the conditions we find ourselves in. What's new is the state of affairs now. What's always unique is that kind of undulating cultural um, uh, flow that is always specific to the time and the era and the conditions that you live in. But the wisdom that myself and anybody who does work like me, and there's many of them, thank goodness, um, it's all old stuff, really. You know, there is, there, is, there is one truth. There is only one truth, but it emanates out, and you make contact with different parts of it at different times in your life. But you're really always trying to go back to that one original truth, which is, you know, pretty trans-dimensional, pretty transcendental. You can't really know it from just one place as a little 3D human meat sack, you know? That's not the point. <laughs> but to trace that truth through your society and through your personal life and through your relationships and through your domestic affairs and your dreams and your desires, that's, that's what this game is about, is to understand the relevance of that to everybody. So, yeah, those, those essays, particularly the So What one, is a commentary on some of that to say, well, you know, let's look at why we're doing this because it is very easy to forget. And like I say, you know, I'm no better than anyone else. I forget and do stupid shit all the time. But um, I keep catching myself doing it and then laugh and then learn from it. And that's the point. You know, you don't need to beat yourself up about doing something that's kind of like lo-fi. Just recognize it and think, you know, gosh, that was stupid. I wonder why I did that. And, you know, what, what are the conditions at the time? What, what was the feeling? What did it get from it? And you just learn all the time and you just become more refined in what you're actually doing in terms of how you're creating your life on a day-by-day -day basis. So, again, my advice is, like, if you're doing something stupid or you know you've got poor habits, again, we all have them, uh, laugh about it and then stop doing them. And then when you do them again, same thing, laugh about it and do them a bit less and gradually, that refinement process, those things that used to be like low-fi bad habits, gradually lose their magnetic appeal, really. So you kind of don't want to watch television anymore. You just really don't. And you'd rather do something else which is cooler and more organic. Yeah, I noticed for myself the, the narrative that I, I seem to be trying to explore, not only in the podcast, but also... Uh, in some of the development work that I do uh, within open source is really attacking the idea of institutions. And uh, the last episode of the podcast, I don't know if you had caught, was focused around decentralization. So I've got a couple different bullet points here that were possible questions tying to the, the idea that we've talked around a lot about inner reality and the outer uh, world. So I want to just read those to you and then let you go off on another step off the edge because you've gone on so many in this uh, interview that I've really enjoyed. And that'll probably end up being the last question that I think we have time for sure. uh, in this. So uh, it was set up a little bit around the idea of uh, collapse and the mainstream negative energy that we were talking about. Is the dissonant vibration of energy like that of a tree that falls in the forest? Just a necessary part of life that provides nutrient-rich environment for new plants to grow? Or extending that analogy to the world of ideas, are large centralized institutions that dominate the economic landscape ancient trees that want to block out the sun for smaller, more adaptive, decentralized initiatives that fear for such saplings will grow out of their shadow to dominate the future landscape? And you've touched on a, a couple examples already, I think, that are fantastic. But what are some of the best things that people can do to expand our capabilities to build a more harmonious environment where everyone prospers instead of the few? I think when you ask big questions like that, you need to look very closely. You need to get out your magnifying glass and look very closely at what's actually going on right in front of you. And immediately, the, the thing that springs to mind, let's be practical, is to... Uh, lessen your exposure and lessen your reliance on the grid shall we say now for some people that's very difficult if you've got like four kids and you know your wife works and you work and you live in a regular suburban neighborhood that that can be difficult that can be very challenging and it may mean that you watch less television and it may mean that you choose to uh, shop 
more consciously and not go to certain places and consciously go to others, go to farmers' markets instead of going to Walmart. Um, you know, a lot of myths about the price of that um, emanates from the supermarkets themselves. You know, I've seen um, lots of farmers' markets and Amish markets in upstate New York, which were just as uh, good value as everything else in um, mainstream supermarkets like uh, Walmart and um, Safeway, or whatever. So, yeah, if if you have a lot of responsibilities that you've chosen to create in your life and you've taken on either gladly or uh, you know unconsciously or whatever, but you, you've got them, you've got the responsibilities, then you have to choose carefully how you're going to put your attention into things and where you're going to put your dollars and stuff. Um, there are more radical things you can do. Um, I definitely always advise people to just stop watching television because it, it does not really give anything at all. And um, because of media nowadays, if you want to watch, you know, that fantastic nature program, just just borrow a disc from somebody, you know, just just watch the bit of it online with no commercials or whatever. And if there's a, a great drama or a great show that you enjoy, again, just just get it offline. Just watch it at your leisure in its in its pure form. But the, the television doesn't depict reality, so that has to go straight away. Um, I think the main thing is is to begin to replace um, synthetic culture with organic culture, to, to replace the artificial with the real. And that invariably means people, basically, in terms of who you interact with and who you share with and who you talk with. Um, so one of the best kind of uh, transitions and developments in my life has been that, you know, I'm in the position now, and it's and to be honest, to, to some degree, it's not massively to do with uh, writing and speaking and doing what I do. It's just personally, just what I've chosen to do as well, um, is actually engaging with people who are uh, doing the same kind of things as you are on a, on a regular basis, not just once every now and again, but on a regular basis. And that, if you can do it, often means moving to a certain place where that is more um, uh, liable to happen. And I've said before, for example, in I've noticed that in California and Oregon and Washington over here in the, the West Coast, uh, there is a very high concentration of conscious people, the likes of which I've not ever seen anywhere else, anywhere before. Um, and I can't ignore that. And then I can go to... Um, you know, Manchester and Bristol and London and have similar wonderful experiences, but not in, the, not in those uh, concentrated proportions, if you like. So sometimes if you're really committed to doing something and you've got the space and time to do it, the resources to do it is, an, is another matter. That, I would say, is a, a, a synchronous um, support by the universe, like... You know, doing the things I've done, I'm usually doing it on a pretty shoestring basis. You know, nobody's funding this. I'm kind of doing it myself, and things all just come into play, usually at the last minute just to keep you on your toes, you know. But that process is supported, especially if you're doing it from a place of integrity and heart, which I personally always try and do, of course, in my life. And I think everybody, you know, with half a brain wants to do the same thing. And so... There is a practical element of if if you're in the middle of um, a big city and it isn't working and you can feel the dissonance, to use a word you used earlier, and you can feel the inauthenticity, then get out of it, leave it, you know, make the preparations that you can do conscientiously, you know, you're not leaving anybody in the lurch, you're not just walking out on your wife and ten kids or whatever, you know, that isn't a very cool thing to do, but you make the preparations to to go where the resonance supports what you're doing. So if you are resonating differently to the way you were two years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, that often means that you physically go to a place that supports that resonance. And that has happened in my life consistently over the last 10 years, particularly in the last two or three. And when I go around and speak to people, they all tell me the same thing. So I've met hundreds of people uh, in 2011 and a lot of those people have told me the exact same story without me even opening my mouth and that has happened and for some people it's exciting and cool and other people's it's a bit scary and a bit perturbing and I think that 
again, is a matter of confidence and a matter of attitude. And you have to, um, you know, take a, a look at yourself and what, what you're doing, where you are, if you're not fulfilled. Because fulfillment really is when you're aligned with your own truth. It's not just a uh, happenstance. It's not just a set of circumstances where you've got loads of money and you can, like, watch a you know, all your favorite movies back to back and you don't have to go to work. You know, that isn't fulfillment. That gets pretty crap pretty quickly. Fulfillment is being in your truth, which is always a matter of growth and is always at some point involving some creative aspect in yourself, not necessarily just art or music, but even just creative thoughts, creative gestures, creative movements, creative dreams, everything, very personal, very ethereal, very subtle. And that, process is what ascendance naturally is humans are playful and light by nature are graceful by nature when left to their own purity and that isn't supported in a kind of metropolis it really isn't so you have to find a balance and that for some people means completely switching that around to something radically different very quickly. And for other people, it means gradually inching away from it. But all movement is good. The, the worst thing is to just stand still. You can't lose ultimately because, you know, everybody gets there in the end. But you need, to, you need to be moving. You need to keep things flexible. I think that's, that's a big key for me. Uh, build flexibility into what you're doing. You know, any commitments you're making should be um, from the head and the heart. To, to people that you care about other than that don't make commitments there's no need you know so these are very practical things and i'm hoping that that's kind of the the tone that you're looking for but that's that's where it begins the philosophical liberation the philosophical empowerment all stems from that because as you go about those deeds your thoughts begin to blossom and your philosophy about what you're doing and how you're doing it and how the universe is constructed to support that begins to fall into place. The universe speaks to that, and it sees what you're doing, and it supports you, and it loves you in what you're doing. And so you're never kind of on your own, even if physically you might find yourself on your own, or even people who are in the unfortunate situation of being in a relationship where they're on their own, so to speak, you're never really truly in that position. Solitude as a transitional stage on the path of awakening is always uh, an initiatory test. So whether you're 25 or 75, it doesn't matter. Any solitude that sometimes creates pain is just a classical initiatory test and it passes and people go through that. So as you go about this process of unfoldment, you meet people who are doing the same thing as you are you magnetize them to you and they to you so it's a process that's totally normal totally organic totally natural and is very very gratifying and is very rewarding in a in the most fundamental sense that that's fantastic and and this conversation has been uh, very much that for me the as i've been listening i've been jotting down some potential titles and you you had a couple of good ones with the electric chair of truth uh, early <laughs> on it was uh great that we're we're engaging in the good stuff or engaging with the good stuff but i think just that that last point you touched on the the title might end up becoming swimming in consciousness mm. you you mentioned the unfoldment a couple times and i know that's the name of the book that you have coming out in the spring do you just want to give a a quick plug to what that is or uh, people can look forward to with it? Sure, thank you. Yeah, the book is called The Unfoldment. As you say, it's out basically in May, I think. And um, it's really a synthesis of a lot of things that I've been talking about for the last couple of years. But most of it is new material, uh, new thoughts, new visions, new ideas. And as ever, what you're really doing is you're sharing your journey. Like, these are the things that I think. These are the things that I feel and anyone who has the vaguest interest in that uh, realizes that although they're always uniquely like mine, if it's me telling it, that there are certain universal resonances in that. And some of the things that apply to me apply to other people too. Um, so it is a book of spiritual philosophy. It's very practical. There's a lot of kind of um, common, uh, commentary on society and culture in there too. So I'm actively kind of trying to engage with a broad audience in this as well. 
without diminishing my message, without, uh, you know, kind of like meekly humbling myself, you know, there's no need to do that. I speak sort of straight as I always do, but I am interested in all the people who are sitting on the fence who are just wondering whether to jump off and launch ahead. So, yeah, it's a, it's going to be a very interesting experiment for me to, uh, you know, I know a lot of people who follow my work will very much enjoy it, and that's fantastic. Uh, you know, that brings me a lot of pleasure. But even more to some degree is the people who don't know anything about me who are going to pick this up and think, you know, what's this guy talking about? Let's 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 find out. So, yeah, that's out in May, and it's called The Unfoldment. And I, I can say with fair confidence that it's going to be an easy read, despite how much you may have uh, suggested that reading is becoming a, a challenging task. <laughs> well, to your audience, I would imagine, yeah, it will be nice nice easy one to drink down so uh, as long as as long as people can sit down and uh, put a few pages together yeah hopefully they'll enjoy it awesome neil thank you incredibly so much for your time and for stepping off the edge thank you